So to introduce myself, uh, I'm Dana Henriksen. I'm an Associate Professor of Leadership and Innovation in the Teachers College here at ASU. My research focuses primarily on creativity in education, but there is specifically a strand of my research that looks at not only the connection between creativity and mindfulness, but also mindfulness and well-being within educational settings. So that is part of what led me to this article written for the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley, which follows some research that I've been collaboratively doing with Natalie Gruber, a doctoral candidate here at ASU, where we have been studying an innovative mindfulness and education program within the Balt School District, where they took some incredible successes with a, mind, a school mindfulness culture program and a school mindfulness intervention that was done in one school in Crockett Elementary, and they have recently been scaling that out to the whole district. So this particular article focused on some of the ways that Crockett Elementary School has seen just amazing transformations and successes for students and teachers and the school community all around through the incorporation of mindfulness. This article was a pleasure to do. It was exciting first because it was an opportunity to communicate in very evidence-based but also practice-oriented ways about the experience of teachers in Crockett Elementary and Baltz School District around the great successes and things that they've noticed, the observations that they've had as teachers and how mindfulness has changed their school culture and their students and really improved their experience as teachers too. The student experience is critical, but we want teachers to have good experiences. If, if both teachers and students aren't feeling a sense of well-being, then it's a problem because those things are very connected, teacher and student well-being. So the opportunity to put that in a way that was very, like I said, practice-oriented and research-based is something that I value because my hope is that it can be read by more teachers and schools and districts. So I can't think of a better place to share some of this work on mindfulness and students' well-being than in the Greater Good Science Center magazine. Greater Good Science Center is part of the resources that Berkeley University has built around the science of well-being and their work is read by about a million people nationally and worldwide and so in that sense it was just a thrilling opportunity to put this work into a place where it has greater reach. There's a better chance of getting it into the hands of teachers, administrators, other education practitioners who I know are busy and maybe do not have time to sit down and read heavy research articles. But in that sense, it is evidence-based, but also practice-oriented, and I think will hopefully be helpful to a lot of schools, classrooms, and districts. So thinking about the question of what would be effective ways to introduce mindfulness practices to students who may be skeptical or resistant, uh, in regards to that question, I would say it's actually much more common to encounter adults who are skeptical or resistant. For the most part, most of the teachers that I've connected with or work with find that students, especially younger students, really enjoy and appreciate the opportunity to practice mindfulness in different ways that really allows them to kind of slow down and take a moment for themselves, um, engage their awareness of their experience, both their inner and outer experience, and have the opportunity to filter out momentarily all of the chaos and concerns of the world. Students, and young students in particular, are often sensitive to and experience the hyperstimulation of media, the internet, life, school, the world around them. So mindfulness can be a really effective way to just give them a moment to focus on their well-being and what's actually happening right now. Mindfulness practices don't look like one thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to ask students to sit down cross-legged and practice classical meditation, but they can be integrated in very natural and comfortable and even fun and engaging ways for students, whether that's practicing mindful eating, getting up for a moment to practice some mindful walking, taking a moment to sort of just take a breath, count down a little bit and notice what's going on with themselves. There's countless practices and they can be fun. There's mindfulness games. So I think for teachers thinking about ways that they themselves would enjoy practicing it or engaging in it with their class and thinking about they know about their students, they can start to identify some interesting, fun, engaging mindfulness practices. With regard to older students, it's possible um, that you might run into some that are uncomfortable or don't like it. College-age students, people who are getting a little closer to adulthood may have some of those 
filters where they think things are silly or they're skeptical or they're not interested. So I think in those cases, maybe not focusing too much on talking a, a lot about mindfulness or meditation, but just the opportunity to focus momentarily on settling down, noticing your experience, practicing meditation in different simple and very naturalistic ways. Mindfulness can be about engaging the senses. For example, the mindful eating practice that I mentioned is one that people often enjoy. It can involve practicing a little mindful hearing. It can be about engaging any of your senses to just kind of stop and notice your experience. So if you're not focusing too much on asking people to sit down and practice formal meditation, I think they'll often enjoy the opportunity to practice a little mindfulness and have a moment to relax, settle in, and let go of momentarily all of the concerns and stresses that we all experience. So I think thinking about what feels most accessible, what feels most natural, and providing a variety of different ways for people to practice mindfulness that can suit different kinds of preferences, tastes, and experiences can allow them to catch on to it a little bit more and enjoy the experience. What would I say to educators who feel like mindfulness is just an additional thing, too time consuming, when we all know that educators, particularly today, have so many demands on them? And I understand that, but what I would say is that mindfulness absolutely does not have to be time consuming or demanding. In fact, it's often best when integrated in small ways consistently throughout the day, throughout a class, throughout a lesson. There's no need to ask kids to, or students, to sit down and, and meditate for an hour or even for 10 minutes or even for five minutes. I think recognizing that there's a wide range of mindfulness practices that can be applied and woven in naturally and seamlessly into existing content, curriculum, or lessons, or that can be used really effectively to stop and give students an opportunity to slow down, refocus, take a breath, whatever they need. So in doing that, in learning a little bit more about the range of different types of mindfulness frames and practices that could be integrated. I think teachers will see that it really isn't something time consuming, but that it actually will give back a lot in terms of time, in the sense that if you can find these small and natural ways to integrate a little mindfulness, both teachers themselves report consistently in research, um, and they report about their students, that people feel like they almost gain some time back because they become more focused, more able to self-regulate, more able to settle down and calm down. I think every teacher today experiences how students can can kind of experience these moments of unrest or tension or frustration or where the entire class sort of feeds off each other and gets riled up and that can be difficult to keep things moving. Or they might just experience times when people get unfocused, stressed, tired, struggling with a lesson and that just taking a few moments or even a moment, letting people breathe for a moment and count down from 10 can really get things back on track and like I said, in that sense gives you some time back. I think there is an old saying in meditation that if you don't have time to meditate for 10 minutes, then you should meditate for an hour, which means that essentially as you give some time to it, you'll get time back. So if you feel like you have very little time and you're stressed and time crunched, just making a small investment or making a regular habit or practice gives you a sense of having some time back in that greater calm, greater sense of clarity, greater sense of focus and awareness. And I would also say that you really only need to look at the research on mindfulness, which shows consistently whether you're looking at mindfulness practice in classrooms, with adults, with children, in any range of context that people experience that feeling of clarity, of better focus, of feeling better and more able to function and perform. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're setting aside that time to try to reach this metaphysical point of awareness, but you're just giving yourself a little time to settle in and notice what you're feeling and self-regulate a little bit better and help others to do the same thing. Are there any specific mindfulness practices that I would recommend for different age levels or grade levels? I think that's something that teachers themselves are the best judge of because students are so individualized in any grade and obviously teachers themselves have an excellent sense of developmental learning and practice. And the experience seems to be for most teachers and certainly in the Baltz District in Crockett Elementary School in our research, the experience seems to be that 
teachers themselves, once they gain a little bit more of an understanding of mindfulness, doesn't mean having to gain an expertise, but just gaining a little bit more understanding of it, they feel much more comfortable thinking about and adapting and evolving practices for their own students. With younger students, it obviously means keeping it simpler. You don't have to talk a lot about the philosophy behind mindfulness. You can do simple things like just asking them to take a breath, to count back from 10. You can ask them to practice mindfulness in ways that lets them be aware of their experience without using that complex language. You can guide them through a little very simple mindful eating or mindful hearing or any of those things. And it can obviously get a little bit more complex as needed for any particular group of students and their individual needs and experiences, their grade level, all of those things. But I think just having teachers start from a place of getting a little bit of understanding of the range of practices, which are pretty simple and straightforward, allows them to think a little bit more about what makes sense for their students. How can teachers assess the effectiveness of their mindfulness practices in classroom? That's a really good question, and I think it depends on what you mean when you use the word assess. And so often we think of assess as being about testing people. Um, and certainly, or, or conducting research, and certainly there have been plenty of teachers who have engaged in action research and plenty of examples where people have assessed mindfulness practices or effects in students through typical testing or research methods. You could create simple surveys for the students. You could sit down and do some interviews with them. So you can assess mindfulness qualitatively and quantitatively in that sense. But I think most often when people think about the effectiveness of a teaching practice, not necessarily content, content we often have to test students on, but when you think about the effectiveness of a teaching practice, a lot of times teachers are assessing based on their own expert instincts or their own awareness and recognition and noticing of what's going on with their students in their classroom and the effects of their practices on them. So a lot of the teachers who have started using mindfulness, specifically in the Crockett Elementary School, have talked about things like noticing that their students feel calmer, feel more well-regulated, feel happier. They've mentioned observing their students, making comments to other students, like, I really love school. Those kinds of things are not things that they had observed that much in the past. So qualitatively and in a very naturalistic kind of way, they've talked about noticing in their teaching practice just a lot of good things happening. So there's always different ways to measure things if you wanted to take kind of a research or a more testing approach, but I think in terms of teaching practices, most, most teachers today would agree that the last thing that students need more of is testing and that they are a pretty good judge of how things are going in their classroom in terms of students' happiness, enjoyment, engagement, behaviors, based on just their ability to observe what's going on day to day. And it does take time to observe those kind of changes. You have to be sort of comfortable over a period of time practicing some mindfulness and getting students to practice it in different ways. But across the board, most teachers who are kind of faithfully trying to think about how to make mindfulness a part of their teaching in one way, shape, or form start to really observe and notice positive changes on a lot of different fronts with students. And that's maybe one of the most important assessments that we can make students enjoying school, students enjoying learning, students able to connect with each other. So how would I advise teachers who are interested in applying mindfulness but are unsure where to start? And I think by that there's a couple things that I would tell them and one would be to first make sure that you yourself feel comfortable and familiar with mindfulness in general, both mindfulness and what it's about, what it means, how you define it, and also some different practices and, and a variety of ways that people can engage in mindfulness. Once teachers themselves have that familiarity and comfort level, doesn't have to mean expertise, but just some knowledge and comfort level with practicing mindfulness for themselves, they'll feel much better in integrating it into their teaching with their students. So starting there, and then also in using it with students, start small. Starting small, but having it be a little bit more regular and consistent is so much better than trying to once a week have them meditate for an hour. That won't get you very far, but integrating small bits of mindfulness, whether it is a few minutes to stop and focus on breathing, turning the lights down for a moment and having students just engage in some silence and think about what they're listening to in the background. What are some of the small little sounds that we don't observe every day? Bringing in a, a snack and having them practice a little bit of just mindful eating 
It can be very quick. It doesn't have to take a lot of time away from the lesson, but just regular small amounts of mindfulness practices in different ways is a nice way to do it that often feels more accessible than trying to worry about having obtained any expertise in meditation or mindfulness or any of that and conveying that to students. So yes, start with getting comfortable with mindfulness for yourself and then think about some small and accessible ways that you can integrate it along the way for your students. How would I respond to critics who might view mindfulness practices as an unnecessary addition to education? And in that sense, I would say that almost all of traditional education in K-12 schools, even today, is really built around what we would think of as traditional in the sense of basic subject matter learning. And that is all really important, but schools can, should be, and always have been also places where students develop as human beings, um, ready and prepared for the future, ready to function in society, socially, emotionally, in terms of their well-being and their ability to cope in the world. So any preparation that schools can offer students in addition to all of the critical disciplinary subject areas, all of those additional components of social learning, emotional learning that we can offer them are really important to not only their health and well-being throughout their life, but their ability to function productively in society and be good citizens. So in that sense, I think knowing that mindfulness does not have to take a lot of time out of any of the traditional curriculum, but can actually truly enhance it so that it's not just an add-on, but it's an opportunity for students to help themselves feel more self-regulated, for students to kind of co-regulate with each other and be able to settle themselves down and focus together. I think that's an incredible benefit to the existing material or any other new material or ways of teaching in terms of curriculum or how we think about what we do in schools. So that ability to help students cope, function, understand their own mind, that's a skill that broadly spans a lot of different subject areas and that they can take throughout life to be more happy, fulfilled, and more able to successfully be citizens in the world. How can schools and districts support the implementation of mindfulness at a larger scale? I would say by approaching it the way that you would or should any systemic effort, any systematic and systemic effort is something that needs to be supported at multiple levels and across the board in multiple places throughout a system. So thinking about it as something where it's not just kind of dropping mindfulness as a practice or a way of thinking into the schools and hoping that it'll take, then we need to think about how it could be integrated in a multi-pronged way. So in the BALT schools where it has really taken hold and been successful, I would say that the leaders in those schools took that kind of a multi-pronged approach where they worked on it with the teachers, not just giving it to them as a new teaching practice or something that they needed to be doing, but talking about it in staff meetings, practicing it with the teachers, sharing research and findings around it with them, giving them a lot of support and training and professional development in terms of what mindfulness is and how they could think about imp implementing it in different ways in their classrooms. And also talking about it with the school community more broadly so that parents know what mindfulness is about and so that the bus drivers are aware of that kids are practicing mindfulness and how that might affect their behavior on the bus um, so that it's part of recess on the playground. So thinking about mindfulness as something that's woven throughout the school day in multiple ways and across different practices and part of the school culture is how we get to using mindfulness in a thoughtful and sustained way within schools and districts. So what do I hope to see in the future in terms of the use of mindfulness practices or the integration of mindfulness practices in education? I would say I hope to see more examples like the Baltz District or like the Crockett School where it's taken up in a much more systematic and sustained manner, where it's not just individual pockets of innovation where teachers are doing it in their classrooms or occasionally trying it out here and there as a way to try to support student well-being but I'd like to see student well-being, students' social and emotional learning become much more important and valued overall in education so that mindfulness practices can be more thoughtfully integrated into curriculum, can be much more part of the way that students think, the way that they attend to their own well-being and their own minds, and the way that they are able to self-regulate in the future going forward. And I think, again, that we get there through a more systemic and systematic approach to it, where it's used consistently and thoughtfully, but in ways that don't 
take away a lot of time or detract from any of the important subject matter learning that students also have to use. And I think we have a couple of good examples of that, not only in the research, but obviously in the Balt School District. And I hope that people can look to those and, and see what's possible. Mm -hmm.